Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Perfights episode where we come now only Henrik and I. Of course, we said that we were going to have guests. Things are coming. <laughs> Beware, be prepared. But uh, for now, it's only Henrik and I. And I think that um, the topic that we're going to be talking about today is making a lot of performance engineers scratch their heads or bot their heads or figure out like, hmm, what is this thing? But before we jump into the topic, Hendrik, how are you? I'm super good. Very excited. Uh, very busy. And uh, a lot of things has been going on my end. Uh, I've published a lot of content, so check it out on my on my YouTube channel. Uh, the Perf by Francais is slowing, grow, getting more content. So we have a small community there. So yeah, very busy and very happy to uh, uh, produce another episode with you guys, with you. Yeah, it's going to be so exciting. Congratulations on Perfites Francais. Sadly, I cannot follow up much on what he said there, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's going <laughs> to ramp up uh, consistently. So after doing all that uh, presentation introduction, what are we talking about? Well, if you saw the title of the episode, probably you know that we are going to be talking about Kubernetes, K8S, yeah. this uh, weird thing that if you're a performance engineer, if you are have been around lots of low testing, automations, creating all our scripts and trying to slam the systems, you may have started to hear that, hey, the tested system is in a Kubernetes cluster, it's in the cloud, it's uh, these fancy terms that we are not starting to. I think it's been already kind of like a, about a year or more, a little oh, bit more. A bit more, that, a bit more. But, uh, that not, not starting to listen it, but now that you listen it, you hear it every corner, like mm. it's everything Kubernetes nowadays. And I know that many are, well, wondering, right? What is this? Why should I care uh, as a performance engineer? And that's also why I was like, uh, Henrik, this one is on you, because um, even as... I, I literally just said this uh, before we started recording. I've read a few books on this, and I feel I have a grasp, but I have never like played in a professional environment or some of these places with Kubernetes. Uh, so he's going to be our source of knowledge, the fountain <laughs> of uh, <laughs> Kubernetes for this episode. But first of all, Henrik, um, what is Kubernetes? So Kubernetes uh, is simply an orchestration platform. It's a smart orchestration platform where, Wait, what? Uh, yeah, but, but orchestration meaning that <laughs> you 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 have um, a central component which is Kubernetes, and then inside of that you have uh, uh, servers, so VM or well, VMs or physical machines or whatever you want that will become a node. So in Kubernetes, there is this notion of master nodes. So master node is the, the, ma the beautiful orchestration that is done by Kubernetes. And then you have the actual nodes that are yours called worker nodes. And those will basically there to, um, to be there to, to host your applications, your, your solutions, your, your software that you want to run in Kubernetes. So this is first understanding that you have two distinct uh, type of nodes, master in one end and the worker on the other end. And the master is where everything, uh, the magic becomes. Uh, so as an orchestration solution where I, I want to deploy something, uh, usually you say, oh, I'm, I'm going to deploy it on server A or I have a container, I'm going to deploy it on the service B or whatever. Here, it's not that. You, you deploy with uh, as code. So it's a, you have a, a structure of different type of uh, configuration, uh, deployment, for, the, the deployment formats. And what the Kubernetes will do is basically look at the available resources and say, oh, okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, this this deployment or this application. Uh, I see that I have some spot available here, so I'm going to place it here. So at the end, you, you don't have to uh, figure out where you're going to place those things. It's going to be done by Kubernetes. And if, if it's so for some reason you're redeploying and the node is fully saturated, you don't have to move. It's Kubernetes going to take it. Uh, put it on the uh, available node, so it, it's quite magical. And then also the other thing that he does is that it's like a, it's a cluster made on several servers. He creates like a virtual network, so everything can just talk to each other. Uh, and then of course, if you want to have it exposed, you will have to do some uh, configuration on network to be able to uh, expose your application from the internet or from your local environment or your ex outside of the cluster to be honest. But yeah, there's so many features. So the net it handles the networking, it handles your resources. 
there is plenty of things you can do. So I think it's a it's very smart orchestration framework. And by the way, do, do you know the story about that? It's um, wait, what? There's a story. Okay, so story time. Story time. So story time. time. <laughs> so uh, the Kubernetes is is a is a project in, from CNCF. And the, the funny story, funny thing about it, if you look at it, who was who was behind this initiative, it was the, all the big players of the cloud. So the Amazon, the uh, GC, the Google, the the Red Hat, uh, the uh, Azure, and so on. And and why are they putting all their efforts to provide this orchestration as an open source? Well, simple. Uh, if you have a smart way of scheduling things then you create a cluster with many machines and then you operate a lot of applications. And at the end, you're dependent on uh, infrastructure. So for the cloud provider, it's the best way of upselling or adding more resources with a smart layer to orchestrate. So it's, it's, a, it's a journey to cloud native in a simple way, I would say, even if it can, uh, it can be perceived very difficult. But once you have understanding the concepts, you will see that, wow, it's so, it's so great, it's so smart, I can do a lot of things. So uh, there's a lot of advantage behind it, behind the scene. So in, from, from this description that you just said, and a cool story, I uh, knew that the big ones were behind all this because it was a need. And you bring up the, the, the orchestration dilemma, to call it in a way, this, this need. But me wearing the, the, the cap of um, a rookie or the sombrero of uh, someone that... Um, Wait, but wasn't the app in the basement or like uh, the the server? We have it down there. Why why does this orchestration becomes a need? Why it is important? What changed from because we never cared that much about orchestration like a decade ago, right? Yeah, but I think it's it's uh, you, you with the uh, so just to simple so there is in the in the master nodes. So if you're in, uh, you're running on Azure Azure GCP on there, wait, 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 wait. What's a node? Because that's a, that's as well. If people are not familiar the node is, at is all, it's a server. It's a service. Like I said, there is a worker node to that will be your where you are going to deploy your application on, and there is the mass the uh, the master nodes that are the the magical piece of uh, Kubernetes. So when you are running on Amazon Azure GCP manage Kubernetes, then those master nodes you don't even see them. It's it's they've been been managed by by the cloud provider. So you will only see the worker node uh, because it, you will only have the master node itself when you start uh, using a rancher where you have your own master node and then you spin up different instances of worker node on on the cloud, or you just have a, an in house cluster with your own machines. Then you will deal with the master nodes. And in dealing with the master nodes, there are a lot of things to consider. There is a lot of different components in the master node. Uh, so first, there is the API. So the API, of course, is for incoming requests. And you say, well, mm -hmm. what should I do with the incoming request? Well, <laughs> when you are using the command line, kubectl, uh, or uh, or yeah, whatever solutions, basically you, you're interacting. Kubectl. Yeah. Kubectl. Yeah, uh, Kubectl. Yeah. Ah, huh. it's cuddle. Cuddle. Yeah. We. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. I, I just always uh, in my mind, I've never heard anyone pronounce it, and I was like, it's a CTL thing, right? <laughs> it's it's yeah. cuddle. Nice. Okay. Well, okay. When you do the keep, keep cuddle, keep CTL apply or deploy, or whatever, basically your you, the command line is interacting with your uh, API API layer, and then you say, I want to deploy, and then the API will start doing the magic. So it will go through a scheduler, say, Oh, I have something to deploy, and then the scheduler will uh, will be there to say, okay, so where should I deploy it? So in each individual worker node, there is a component called kubelet that is in charge of the local orchestrations. And then the, uh, the scheduler reach out to each individual node at the beginning and to their kubelet instance and say, okay, uh, I need to deploy something here. Where should I deploy it? Who has resources? And then one of the kubelets says, oh, I have some resources available. Uh, and then say, okay, right. So now I'm going to give you the... The, the the deployment files and you will be in charge of deploying. So then kubectl, the kubelet receive your deployment files and then deploy whatever you have you have configured in the local node. Um, so that's that's uh, the scheduler. And then you have another um, instance called etcd. etcd is like the, the database of the object. So then every time you deploy, there is like a, a, a trace of a status of, of your objects. So uh, this is very, very important aspects of uh, 
Kubernetes because at the end, etcd is is aware of that. Oh, your application A is on node B or whatever. So then it keeps track on everything. So that's it's, it's a core component. For example, if you do mass, if you have your own uh, in-house cluster, uh, yeah, etcd is clearly <laughs> something that you need to pay attention. If it explodes, yeah, you won't be able to do much <laughs> with the, with. The, and same thing if the API is completely saturated. If you have too many calls coming on the API, yeah, you can imagine that uh, you will have issues to schedule. You have issue to interact with, so there is a lot of things concerned uh, to be to be uh, concerned when you are uh, managing your own Kubernetes cluster for sure. So, for for what I am understanding, all all this orchestration, all these components that Kubernetes has that uh, are, is like separated tasks. Each one does uh, one one key element, like the API receives uh, all the instructions. I remember that you have some of the configuration files that can be also um, set up. And all the all these related to this goal of orchestration. But I'm still not sure I'm following. Why do I need this? Why, why do I want to orchestrate stuff? Didn't I just install my application on a server and I was good to go? Or? Yeah, but the difference is in the past, you if you if I needed to deploy something on a server, I need to connect to that server through different way, so SSH or other stuff, or or you use a Terraform script that 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 spin up these instances and you deploy automatically inside of that box. But you have a reference of machine A is with I'm putting a container or whatever inside of that. Here, Wait. So we are using containers on this. Uh, on, it's an it's a it's a container orchestration. That's true. But at the end, you 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 don't care. I mean, you, you there is a you 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 have a advanced way of deploying with a, this notion of tens and tolerance and label selector and so on. But in general, if I don't put anything like this, I deploy. I don't even care on where my application ends. It will run anyway. So and then what the advantage is that I can start. Uh, with a three worker node uh, cluster. And then I can put some auto scaling policies that will add a nodes based on the load. So then instead of having only three big instances of servers, suddenly you have another one that adds. So then your cluster be become bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and uh, and then you will have more and more applications. So it's, it's kind of smart way of orchestrating things. Of course, the question that usually pops up in your mind is that do I need one cluster that will do everything or do I need smaller clusters that do and then separate the things. So that's more an architecture approach, but there is some limitation by running huge clusters. Uh, I can, of course, explain you those constraints, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yeah. I, I think that um, some key components from your uh, description, you, you mentioned that it is containerized our application uh, now is kind of different, not anymore the monolith application, not anymore. And I, I, I want to point out that these type of solutions are thought of, or I think there are a few components and elements that made us get to the point to need orchestration first. Um, I think that this splitting out uh, of our applications into not the monoliths, uh, not services, but many times nowadays is microservices. And as you very well said, it can be on a server downstairs, it can be on this cloud, it can be elsewhere. Our microservice, we don't, we can even kill it for a little while while it's not being used to bring it up again. Some of those characteristics of microservices, I think are part of what bring the need for Kubernetes. Completely. The second is that they are brought up in a container. And I think we've got to make an episode on Docker eventually. Uh, and containers, but, but just to, to for example make a difference. People, you, a lot of people use Docker Compose, where you you put containers, you list, and then you have a network, local network with your Docker Compose. But you need to deploy it on a big big machines. Here, you don't need that complex because you have all the you create you're creating that silly question. If with a Docker Docker Compose, you have to uh, build up everything in the same machine. A single Docker Compose? When you deploy it, it's going to be in a single machine. Yeah. In a single? Yeah. That's another big difference, right? Yeah, because here you don't even care. The the Kubernetes will create the network. So just to, to simplify, so the way it works on the networking side, there's few concepts that people need to understand. So you mentioned containers. So in Docker Compose, you will only have containers. Well, in Kubernetes, you have a pod. 
And that part, which is an uh, abstraction on top of the it's, container, it's a, basically a pod is made on one container usually, but you can add as many containers as you want. Mm -hmm. And there's no the, if also you, if you want to do some init tasks, you can add an init container so that init container will be running before the other ones do some stuff that you want and then your application container will run or sometimes you want to do the networking so there is a, a concept of service mesh where um, the the scheduler is injecting automatically a sidecar with container so which means all the networking logic will be added as an extra container so I, at the end i don't have to to code anything i just focus on my app and the enrichment the security could be uh, injected uh, through those sidecar container approach so so the notion of pod made of several containers make it very dynamic and makes uh, you can build your pod made of several components. So I think it's quite smart. So that's, the, I would say the container is the your app that will end up in a pod. And then to deploy that pod, usually you don't deploy a pod like, like, like this. You deploy it either through a deployment, either from a stateful set or from uh, a Chrome job or from uh, a daemon set. So maybe I can explain the differences. So a deployment Please. is uh, a, a stateful, it's a, a not, it's a stateless application. So you can say, oh, I have two applications that are stateless and I need three replica. So you put three and when you deploy, boom, it will add the three replica. And then this num number, number of replica, if you want to do auto scaling, there's even an object that will do the scaling for you. So that's magic. Uh, so called a horizontal part of auto scaler. So that's the deployment. Deployment, you say, okay, so I have an app and I have a template to deploy. And if my my pod dies, and then it's because it's part of the deployment, Kubernetes says, oh, you ask for three containers, three pods, sorry. And then he says, oh, you only have two, so I'm gonna schedule another one. So I don't have to do anything. The orchestration is doing the, the thing behind the scene for me. So that's why it's you always deploy your pods uh, through those uh, different type of deployments, so deployments, set for certain others, because at the end, the orchestrator he is always going to make sure that the your requirements of number of uh, a component you need will be always true. And that, that's that's beautiful. Stateful set. I think in, in, in lame, lame terms, some of this um, management that you are describing is, uh, and the need, why are we having this? Because uh, I, I know so many performance engineers that are like, uh, why does this matter to me? And the fact that you have these pods and the different um, type of pod that you can generate uh, and that they are mm, most of the time stateless, you don't care. And hey, if the capacity of this pod has reached out, the performance starts to degrade, blah, blah, blah. Part of what Kubernetes will do as an orchestrator will say, ah, maybe I need another one. Maybe I need to uh, scale them up sites. I don't know. Because uh, you cannot grow them uh, vertically very easily. It's just yeah. like add another No, no, no. There is, a, there is an object called VPA, vertical part of the scaler. Does that work well anyway? Uh, really? I mean, I would, I mean, I honestly, that there were some issues with no, that. No, the honesty with the VPA, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of that. And I will explain later because we need, I think from a performance engineer, we need to understand how resources are, are working in Kubernetes because there are a few things that needs to be considered. Um, so yes, you can scale vertically and yes, you can scale horizontal, horizontally. So that's why there is those two default objects called VPA for vertical and HPA for horizontal. And then you're, you're basically... Um, quick, quick side thing. What is the difference? What does it consist? So uh, scale VPA, vertical and VPA horizontal? is that you have a pod starting with 500 megs and then you, you make a rule, say, oh, if I am reaching that KPI, whatever, growing. So then it will change the configuration of your pod to say, okay, so you reach the limits, I'm going to increase you. So now suddenly you're becoming one gig component or two gigs and so on. So the problem with VPA is that you're, you're I, will, yeah, I need to explain the, the, you remember I explained the fact that uh, uh, Kubernetes, the orchestration says, okay, so this is a, a, a pod or an application that requires 500 megs. So I'm going to place you here, but with VPA, you have requested for some for certain number of resources and suddenly this is growing. So, so at the end, the management of the nodes can be more tricky at the end. I, I, I want to do an analogy here. That's how I explain, uh, this, uh, growth patterns that you will see. Think of the, these pots as, uh, stacks of pancakes. 
I know Perfites has a history with pancakes. And if you want to grow vertically, you just add another pancake on top and you can increase your single pancake stack. If you want to, uh, that was vertical. If you want to grow horizontal, well, you need another dish Thanks. and another set of uh, uh, pancakes. The problem, what you're saying that Kubernetes uh, gets into with vertical growth is like you already kind of had the dish for the pancakes and what's kind of thought of. You should, should consider, uh, because when you deploy, you, there is notion of requests and the notion of limits. So that, that's a good mm -hmm. thing to do. So that's, that's a very the important- The dish has a limit so, for pancakes. Yeah, so this is a very important point for a performance engineer because they have to understand that piece. Um, the, you have the, no, the notion of requests and the notion of limits. So what is the request is basically I say, oh, to run my app, I need in minimum this. And when the scheduler runs, at the beginning, he looks at the requests. Okay, so this is a big box that, that is about 500 or one gig. So I'm gonna find the spot on my available nodes where I have that resources available in terms of CPU that you requested in terms of memory. So basically it's like a Tetris. So it's taking your shape and then looking at the lines, where, where, where do we have an empty line? And then it's- No, 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 no. It's pancakes, and then I have for fried eggs, for sausages, <laughs> and what is the spaces inside of the dish that you have? No, this is more like taints and tolerance. <laughs> Say, I want a yeah, pancakes yeah. for sausages. So then he looks at for nodes that are sausages. And then and you're, you're already taking the space of that in the dish for the <laughs> sausages. I, I can't play with this. That's part of the situation that you will find into. But yeah, so that's that's the request, and um, and, and then one thing is in Kubernetes, you can you have ask for five hundred megs, but there's nothing limiting you to consume more. So that's why you you have this notion of limits. Limits is like oh, you cannot consume more, and uh, and the, the the this concepts of limits is super important. And there's a big debate in the industry, by the way. So usually you set limits on memory. And there's a lot of people say, don't set limits on CPU and so on. So I will explain wh wh why you don't set, um, you, why you could or you could not, depending on how you feel it, uh, limits on your CPU. But the limits on memory is that, okay, so I have requests of 500 and I know that I can, in certain cases, because I've done a load test, I can reach out to one gig or 1.5 gig. So I will put a limit, 1.5 gig. And then if for some reason I'm reaching out 1.5 gig, then the kubelet knows those limits in the node and says, oh, you reach out to the limits, so I'm gonna kill you. So he kills the pod and it says, it's called an OM kill, so out of memory kill event. And then you're aware because with the resolutions, your community is generating a lot of events and then you will be aware that, oh, my pod has been killed because of the limit situation on the memory. And, that, and, and quick parenthesis, what happens to the poor user that was talking to that pod? Ah, uh, yeah, but that, that's where you need to, do some load test and, and configure. You don't never, people usually don't know, So, but as a performance engineer, you should know. Why you, they don't usually know? Because it's a stateless, right? This new design, most of the time. <laughs> yeah, but at, at the end, if you just do a, one test with one pod, uh, you, you know how much resources you need in, for that pod, and then you can, you can basically uh, uh, set those limits uh, in the proper way. Mm -hmm. But there are some other tricks with these pods, some advantages. We'll, we're going to get back to that in a moment, but... Uh, you can also um, release a new version of whatever that pod was running. Same thing. You just kill it and you can have another two ones no, in the same no, thing more. and bring you a just, new one. And you, blah. Do, you do a rollout. Mm -hmm. And by, by doing a rollout, this is great because it's going to take your new application. It's going to spinning up. Once those new app is actually running and healthy, then it will, tear down, it will tear down the others. So at the end, there is no downtime. It's, mm -hmm. this is Kubernetes. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> it's so sexy. <laughs> but, but keep going, going what you were. Uh, uh, yeah, so on the, on, the, on the CPU limit, CPU side, this is very important. So um, because it relies on, on uh, images or so containers, then the way you're uh, sharing CPU resources is based on um, uh, a Linux concept called CFS and C groups. So basically, it says, okay, so I have a, I have a core, a CPU, a CPU, and I'm going to split the cycles of my CPU uh, on the diff different tasks that I have to do. And um, so one CPU cycle in general, it, it's, it's, it's not in general, it's, it's the number. One CPU cycle is 100 milliseconds. And when you put a limit, basically, you, you're, you're going you're to tell Kubernetes or the container environment, how many milliseconds can I consume 
within that cycle. So if I put a 20 uh, limit, it will mean that I can consume 20 milliseconds of work on, that, on a one CPU cycle. And what it has happening, so I work, I reach the 20 milliseconds, and then the system says, oh, you, you reached the limit, so I'm going to pause you. So then during the next 80 milliseconds, your app is like <laughs> waiting. Mm -hmm. Suffering. And then next CPU cycle starts, you can rework 20 milliseconds and <laughs> work, wait, wait until the next CPU cycle. So this concept of waiting, uh, working, waiting, working, waiting, working, waiting is called CPU throttling. So basically mm -hmm. you're you're throttled because you're waiting. So you measure, you're measuring the, how much time you've been waiting for actually have CPU cycles available to actually do your work. So CPU uh, CPU throttling is you can imagine how your app Messy. is working is like is like a you're starting a car <laughs> so it's and, and and it's something that can are you starting not yet okay do something else are you starting not yet okay something else oh, okay oh yeah yeah okay then I'll start the car okay next and and that switching as well gives some performance considerations of course, that we it's, have to it's, pay attention it's a to. disaster in terms of CPU. <laughs> i mean i've did some tests with without limits and with limits so with, with with limits that were not tuned i had a service that was like a responding in less than 100 milliseconds and then when i defined those bad limits i had 1.5 seconds response times so just throttling is killing the performance so that's why you, when you deploy this is something that you should look. Did the limits, the resources, been well defined? Because at the end, uh, yeah, the, the behavior of the application, you said, oh, I've tested it on my container, on Docker Compose, it worked very well, and then it doesn't work on Kubernetes. Yeah, maybe the way you've deployed it is not well, so you should reconsider and tune up those settings. So that's really, really important. And one thing, no. just to go back to the requests, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I didn't mention it, but what you're requesting is basically your if I request one gig and I only need 10 megs, then you are wasting money. Because the system says you need one gig, I give you one gig, and nobody else can use it. So that's why people, when they start, usually they over provision, so they put very high numbers in the request value, which is a waste because at the end you will look at your cluster, oh, I don't have any resources available. Yeah. Yeah, they are allocated, that's true. But do you actually use them? And then that, that's why you have to always look at how much did I request and how much did I actually use to fine tune? Because at the end, you may have, uh, I, I remember I had a customer says, oh, uh, we, we are adding every week a new node on the cluster. I say, oh, that's kind of weird. And then I ask them to show me the numbers and they were over provisioning like hell. And, and all the hmm. nodes were super allocated but at the end, they were not doing much. So, so, so this is also from a from a cost perspective and from an energy perspective. Try to be gentle and figure out how much exact resources you need, because otherwise you will ask for something, but nobody will be able to use it because you've asked it for it. It's it's a little. Uh, it reminds me of the old days again when we had a single application, the monolith downstairs in the basement or the data center where um, sometimes our performance tests would be like, hey, how far can the user go to max utilization? Or as well, there were some tests like, hey, are we using the resources well for our system on an average day? And there were some projects where we were like, hey, you at a busy day are using like 10% of your server power. You may want to use that RAM on something else. On those days, it wasn't that easy. I mean, some L parts, you could just remove the RAM, put it elsewhere, and uh, you were good to go. But that's another big advantage of this thing because I, I think of cloud resources like musicians. You hire them by time. And if for any reason you didn't want an electric guitar, but the musician came to the event, wedding, whatever you are having the musicians for, they are sitting there. You have to pay them. And in cloud environments, that's a big concern that also Kubernetes helps to avoid because uh, it kind of monitors how you are using the resources, you can extract information about this and tune it. And performance-wise, because this this is always something that uh, performance engineers always like response time and uh, efficient use of resources. And here's another tier: it's not efficient use, efficient allocation of resources. Because now bad performance is not that before didn't, but it translates into money 
way faster than I have no idea how much this customer that kept adding pods um, the cloud bill uh, must have been. I think they were, it was uh, on prem for so that was a difference. But uh, oh, okay. they were they were like ordering machines every week, which was insane. So I think yeah, <laughs> but yeah, but I mean I mean Kubernetes is great, but but there are a few things that need to be considered. Otherwise, the experience is bad. And and to just to 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 re to remind the fact that it's smart on the node side there are conditions so if if the the node is saturated for cpu uh, for memory for for ip for network for something then kubernetes is, is considering when you orchestrate oh this node is not healthy or seems not healthy so i'm not going to put anything in in, inside of that or if you know, the node is actually completely saturated then he will start what we call a, an eviction process so he will he will remove workload from that node to move it to another node and you don't even see it i mean usually uh, if if it's removed it's put in somewhere else but you could remove it and say oh shit, i don't have place anywhere <laughs> so then then it then it's a disaster <laughs> so this eviction is is a uh, could could kill yourself, but also it's it's kind of nice because you have this smart, automated stuff that that try to recover, that try to help you uh, to make a reliable application. And and that's some of the other advantages I was mentioning earlier in the way that you release software uh, that you can say, hey, well, I have this new API class service, whatever you are trying to release. Uh, there you go, Kubernetes. I'm releasing it figure it out. And there are so many things that it will be like, okay, what nodes do I have to put this pod on? Uh, oh, oh, there, there's some space. And it's that type of efficient allocation that as well, um, okay, so maybe I need to divide it. It doesn't fit, completely fit here. And I have two other pod, uh, pods available. Okay, here, here, and there. Uh, oh, well, then now I need a network um, communication pattern among those uh, components. It's, it does internal load balancing because uh, it has to say like, oh. Yeah, so here you're going to the to the networking side. So we didn't cover that. It has another side. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is super important as performance engineers that we pay attention to. Because it's funny, I have seen some complaints of old problems that we saw in load balancers happening internally in Kubernetes that. I mean, the, the load balancing works, I mean, like I said, the, the deployment, there is a stateful set where if you have a stateless application for database, mm -hmm. you will deploy a stateful set, but then you have a, you have the actual pod container, your your stuff, but then you want to expose it from a network perspective, you need to create a community service. And and that makes the load balancer because the service can have, okay, so I have, I have a service and, and uh, all the pods that match this, uh, those labels or the, this, this selection will, will be served by this service. And then you you explain on a service, okay, so I have uh, on the port 80, uh, I will go three. And the port 81, I will go here. So basically you're explaining how the the, the, the service will behave in terms of networking and, and which protocol uh, will be uh, used to reach out to the pod. So I, I, I receive 80 port, on the port 80, and then I will route to the port 88, for example, uh, on the container level, so on the pod level. So the service is very important, and behind the scene, there's a lot of things. I'm not going to go too on too much on mm, details. It's deep. <laughs> yeah, because you have a, a core DNS, so there's a DNS instance on all your um, on all your uh, kube proxy. It's on running on all the nodes, and then you have a core DNS that do the DNS resolutions. And uh, so the service name is is a uh, is uh, going to be part of the DNS uh, rules. And then uh, uh, locally, there's a kube proxy. Uh, that will do like a sort of an IP table approach. So every node has its own IP table, um, of course, because it's a, it's a physical machine. And uh, depending on, on, let's say, I have uh, 6,000 services running on my cluster, it means that each individual node will have an IP table rules with those 6,000 uh, services with service A, blah, blah, blah. So then you reach out the IP to a service A, and then he says, okay, I, I have containers behind then I need to reach out which IP address of the container should I result. So there is a networking mechanism behind the scene and you it works smoothly. But again, if you're if you have too many service too much services, then the IP table is, is a limitation. We know that from from a normal the old environment. Internet days. Yeah, yeah. If you have allocated too much no port, then you start to have port conflict. 
uh, within your nodes. Uh, you can have also if if the uh, kube proxy on the on the node is not running well, then you can have some networking problems. If if the core DNS is not running well, same thing, you're running into problems. So there are few pieces here and there that could explain why it is it's slow. Usually it works well, but again, if you see something slow, then there are areas to look at and it's very clear. If you understand a networking PC in, in Kubernetes, then it's going to be super clear. It, it also requires some knowledge and understanding from just networking because there's, there's another one. Uh, some of these issues that I have uh, heard of, given the, the balancing capabilities and, and the networking, you very well said there's a limit of five pieces. It's based on a system from the old days that if you don't know those limits, you might be like, I, I don't understand why I can't go over like 256 elements in this one. I want to have more. Why is this failing? And that that um, leads to performance issues when you cannot expand. And uh, speaking of expand, the other element that I wanted to mention about that is cool about Kubernetes and why it is becoming a wildfire expanding all over the place. Traditional applications, when you were saying, uh, yeah, I um, release this application, we'll need these uh, resources. It's not like you are turning on Kubernetes and then it brings, no, no, Kubernetes should be running permanently and should be like on top of things, uh, checking your elements. You may have a second uh, instance that in case the main Kubernetes fails, you can have some um, sustainable. But the cool thing is that your applications are like an abstraction. You can bring them up, destroy them. As you say, many times, many of these elements are stateless. The, the, um, in traditional days, when we were working with an automation and talking to an application, it had the view state. It had to know in which page were you navigating through. It had to keep a lot of control. Nowadays, with these microservices and all these um, new technologies that we are dealing with, it doesn't matter. You can kill the machine and probably you have two other more pods that will be talked to. And that gives this capability of one continuously release. You can just like, ah, yeah, oh, that failed, roll back. Now it brings back another pod with the previous version. You can even configure some of these things like, okay, we have 10 pods and we have this new version of the service, the software, whatever you are releasing. Okay, do two at a time. And start checking how things go little by little. Yeah, but this is going to be done with other components uh, like the service mesh, for example, where you do a yeah, traffic yeah, yeah. speed, for example. But yeah, you, you can do, Kubernetes is the engine, but then on top of that, you you you, you deploy you tools. Give many more capabilities. And then the tools give you a, a, even more options. And what is cool mm. is that the, those tools, when you deploy them, they, they extend the objects in the API of Kubernetes. So, and, and then it means that you have new objects. So I mentioned deploy, deployment, Stateful sets, statement sets, uh, those are core objects of Kubernetes. But then if I deploy a service mesh, I will have new objects, the virtual service, the getaway, the lot of, and then I don't have to configure from a UI. I have a, a YAML, or it's, a, it's an object where I, I can basically configure everything and then deploy it and then boom, everything is set up. So that's, that's kind of cool. And even through the API, you can update those uh, YAMLs and some new now, now I want four pods instead of only one or cool things that, and, 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 and yeah, I forgot what I was getting to with this. Performance wise and capacity wise, Kubernetes also has that capacity that we were saying to expand, increase, like, okay, this pod is about to explode, run out of RAM. We need uh, more because the users keep asking for more. You can have some of those instructions and when you are this this uh, performance test that I remember, how many virtual users can I'm like? Um, don't um, I don't know how to answer that anymore. Because and uh, with that, you are going to be growing your environment. So when the customer tells you like how many virtual users, is this uh, gives some expandability and capabilities to your environments that. This traditional way of thinking performance testing or load testing, uh, I think brings up a, a mindset change totally uh, flipping, right? Completely. What, what, I mean, I mean, think there's so many advantages where I don't need, I mean, I can, I can deploy my testing tool in the cluster. Uh, they will be exposed so I can easily reach out to this application to test them. 
um, there are there are so many things, great things behind the scene. I think, uh, and I mean, I don't know. For me, it's <laughs> it, there is so many things that uh, make your life easier in general. To especially when you have to, to test the, those complex environments. The other great thing that I I think from my perspective is observability, uh, because there is like a, an inventory of objects, and then by just interacting with the community's API. Um, some Prometheus or other solutions, what it's basically what it does, it, it says, oh, give me uh, all your deployments, all your pod, all your namespaces, all your blah, blah, blah. And then uh, you get the resources. So um, it, it makes the monitoring, sorry, the observability, <laughs> much more simpler, much more easier. And the great value of that is it's keeping, it, it's, it's like a, it, it's like an open book where every resources is here with a precise reference. So it's a pod name, it's a deployment name, it's a namespace on a node, and so on and so forth. So when you're grabbing a metric, you already have all those dimensions attached. So which means, oh, I want to look at the usage of um, this pod, and I know that, that that pod is running on two different node, let's compare the usage. And by doing a split, you will see that this. So th there is, it's a controlled environment. So I think from a, from a cloudy perspective, when you do a lot of uh, open source or a lot of uh, observability or, or, or a lot of testing, you have this, uh, the, the, the fact that it's, you have a lot of data uh, access uh, available without any effort. So that this, I think it's, it's, it makes our life in general easier. But of course, we discussed about it. If you're uh, used to you run into bare metal environments, you have you know the, the the physical limits of those servers. They will be still out there, so nothing change. It's just that you have a, a layer on top that makes the beautiful orchestration we talked about. And if you understand both side, and you understand the constraint of Kubernetes, then you can diagnose, you can analyze, and you can point out easy easily the problem. I think that in the past I. It was never optional. It was never a good idea to be out there without monitoring and observability and your old, even monolithic applications. But you make a very good point because nowadays, is uh, if it was important before, now it's critical. Kubernetes has a lot of out of the box uh, possibilities, but you need to add up some some of this because the, the situation something failed. You have a performance issue from your automation. You detected a problem. Oh, let me go in and check. Uh, sorry, that pod doesn't exist anymore. We what? <laughs> and some of these, I think it's crucial because all these moving parts that Kubernetes allow you to do, even if you have an, a bare metal single box Kubernetes instance that, yes, becomes an extra layer of abstraction inside of that box, but still, you can have nodes all over the place. Uh, you, you can... Uh, I, I've seen crazy people in some smartwatches put, create them, turn them into nodes and... <laughs> in theory, it works. And and uh, not to mention Raspberry Pis and some other Internet of Things, uh, that without a good observability capability, uh, it rhymes, you'd be lost pretty quick to know what is happening inside of your uh, Kubernetes cluster or clusters because it can get not crazy, but complex, very complex, very fast and very easy. And from the perspective of, of a performance engineer or an SRE that you want to kind of fix things or know what happened or um, give a, a report of how is the experience, user experience, why is it bad, what is happening, it, it used to be difficult in a monolithic application. Now with a microservice, cloud, elastic, kubernetable, I don't know if that's a, <laughs> a word, uh, application, Good luck without observability. No, yeah, it's it's because you're you're first of all you're you're you need to make sure that the system that runs your application, so the communities and the nodes, they are healthy, healthy and running well, and then that your your application is running well as well. And then you have a you have a if you don't configure well your cluster, um, yeah, there is a, you you an application that is quite. Uh, quite uh, heavy in terms of resources 
it could start eating the resources of yours, your own applications. And then, mm -hmm. then your application be, be, be start be, be, uh, running weird because you're, again, it's a shared environment. So then this is where you, from lesson learn, you will start, ah, oh, we're going to put quotas, we're going to limit. So the, the, I would say communities have so many options where you can basically control and limit things. And this is why I think it's quite smart. Uh, so uh, the, there is, I mean, when you're a performance engineer, usually you don't, you are not the one that's going to deploy and you rely on someone else, but at least you, you, you get to understand what is happening yeah, in the exactly. back end. Exactly. Yeah. To, to, to keep, because, because as performance engineers, we, of course, we generate load, we automate some things, we, but in the end, we give those insights like, Hey, I noticed that, um, I don't know, your pots were just growing and not being killed, I don't know, to give a silly example. If you don't know what is a pod, what is happening, why it might be not well configured or what is uh, the, the change on the YAML that you are suggesting or that, um, again, performance engineers, we were not the ones giving the solutions because you are not a database expert, you're not a networking expert, you're, but you can sniff where the situations and the problems are. If you are performance and load testing, modern Kubernetes environments, you need to understand what is happening back there. And, and it's, it's not the backend anymore. Again, in the basement can be a single box, bare metal, but most frequently what you're going to walk into nowadays, uh, they are spread over cloud environments that who knows where they are. It's in a data center, probably, I don't know, in Illinois, in Mexico City, or uh, uh, underneath the building that you are sitting on. You, you, Hendrik, there in France? No, I'm kidding. Um, and and it gets complex. It gets. But 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 this is why the, the the this notion of events and metrics and so on, because every everything that is uh, going through the scheduler or or if there is something happening, it's there is an event sent, um, and usually all those observed solutions um, in the community environment they are grabbing those events. So. If you have a specific problem, even even if you don't know how this application has been deployed, but just looking at the events, you have like a, you you know exactly what happened. Uh, so the investigation is much easier because everything is tracked, um, and also of course e, the deployment files usually they ends up in the GitHub repo because it's a YAML file. Uh, so you don't have to be a bash master or terraform master anymore you can just look at the deployment oh, okay this is what oh, okay so it requires the volumes okay so there's two replica ah now I... so you have access to that information that in the past when you were running in those traditional bare metal environment it was you could have access to it but sometimes it was more complicated to have access to it yeah the the, the openness of this information has improved it's uh more shareable i think than ever yeah i i, I on some places and setups, I don't think we are 100% there. Like it's just as easy, here's your link, have fun. But we're getting there. And uh, uh, that's a great thing that I remember. You had to uh, kiss the ring of the Pope, jump through <laughs> hoops of fire and all some other things that uh, that would give you access to the backend server metrics <laughs> so that you could give a better uh, insight into why the response time was getting slower when you had like a throughput of blah. Um, Nowadays, you have that huge advantage that it will give you a lot of information, at times too much information, if you're not careful. Uh, but you got to understand what is happening. What are some of these um, messages are telling you? What is a span? If you can uh, expand it, if you can go through it. And how some of these relate to Kubernetes. Because some particulars of these type of observabilities, metrics, traces, logs, all the things that you are going to get. If you don't know what Kubernetes is doing, you may be lost to like, um, what happened here? What is this span thing? Why why can't I dig into it further? Oh, well, it didn't even connect. The pod was not there. I don't know. This CSI performance thing that we do when we are on a project gets very interesting. Um, make sure that you have access to these. Make sure that you understand a little bit. I think, um, looking at the time, we're ramping down already. Um, but but I hope 
go on, I, go on. I think the, the topic is huge, so I think it was more yeah, like yeah, an introduction. Yeah. Uh, drop us a comment on, on if there are topics that you want us to cover in details in the Kubernetes world, because it will be interest, more interesting uh, based on, on your requirements and your, and your need. Uh, but I think we, we could we could provide another type of episode where uh, explaining, for example, how what are the uh, default resources or uh, metrics or, or data that you could get easily uh, in most of a community's environment without any major efforts. Uh, that could be an interesting uh, aspect. And maybe mm -hmm. also uh, more go deeper on the networking, because I think if you want to understand what's going on on the networking side, it will be also useful. Um, and maybe we can do another episode on the service mesh, just the service mesh, because uh, from a performance engineer, it's going to be also very useful. And and even some others, don't be ashamed if there are some topics like a container, wait, what, Docker Compose, some things that the testing community are just at times uh, a little extraneous to those terms. Don't worry, let us know, and we will be happy to dig deeper to check what other technologies, hey, in terms of observability, hey, what's this open telemetry thing? What is this Prometheus thing? Why does it matter? Why do I see it? Um, I don't know, in my J meters being mentioned, how is it different from Influx? So many other of those things. Let us know if you have questions and you, if you're dealing in your modern performance engineer day to day, that you are like bumping heads or getting stuck. Let us know, we'll try our best to share again Kubernetes is huge. I think we just scratched the surface, just jumped all over the place, uh, <laughs> terms, topics, and things that I you think can do with it. Yeah, we, we just explained briefly how, how it mm -hmm. worked, but uh, we could obviously go deeper on, on, on specific topics in specific yeah. episodes. It, each one of these things, just, just Kubernetes, just containers, just uh, observability, can be a video series for uh, profites, just like so, sub-playlists. Let us know. It's interesting. And nowadays it's very important. It's super important. You have no idea to grasp these con concepts and apply it to your performance engineer day to day. Or if you're an SRE or if you are uh, operations or some other uh, practices where you deal with these things. Um, I hope that at least we gave you some glimpses of uh, understanding. <laughs> and I look forward to, to, to more knowledge and to more things. Um, Hendrik, what do you look forward to? What's coming soon for you? Uh, for me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm going to start, so I'm, I'm finishing a series on agents. So I'm looking at different agents of the, of the market. I'm, I'm trying to do a benchmark to compare those. And mm -hmm. I'm uh, going to start exploring more... Uh, uh, how to provide security in a, in a community cluster, what are the things that you should consider, and then maybe there are out, out there a couple of open source solutions that may help you, and then I will probably cover those solutions one by one. So trying to bring the security angle into the observability angle, because uh, security in the in the observability, because I think security uh, is uh, could, be, uh, could generate a lot of uh, metrics or traces or logs, whatever it is, and it could help you to, uh, to understand uh, given problems based on uh, if you have ingested this data back in your observability solution. Hmm. Uh, this is an is it observable? Yeah, it's right. Great. Yeah. Uh, if you are not subscribed to is it observable, uh, hit subscribe, activate the bell, thumbs up, all those YouTube things. Uh, don't miss it up. Any in the conference front activity? You're going to conference, be I will around? be in uh, KCD in Istanbul, uh, and I will be in KCD Barcelona, and I will be uh, see I will see Almus, and that's that's, that's awesome. Uh, oh, and, shall we have another perfect? Oh, it will be great. Huh? And I will be also in KCD Zoo, uh, Munich as well. Uh, yeah, a couple of conferences com coming in. Uh, I'll be there for sure. Stay tuned. You're going to be that bearded guy walking around those conferences if you can <laughs> <laughs> join them. Or if not, I'm sure, Hendrik, you're going to uh, publish some report and experience from the field. Sure, I would do. Um, on my end, uh, if you are watching this and when we are planning to release it, in a couple of days, I will be reporting from Star East, uh, doing the usual streams and walking activities as well. Yeah, it should be done by now. Uh, in Señor Performo, it's in Espanol, but uh, subtitles are coming soon, so stay tuned. In the uh, YouTube channel for Señor Performo, we're talking about this, the history behind JMeter. What is it? How it came to be? What are its characteristics? Um, in the past, we had some others like 
some of these evolutions, how do they affect the QA world, and uh, the six infinity stones of uh, load testing types. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there was cool. another, <laughs> another video uh, describing them. Uh, if you're watching this in English, subtitles are coming soon so that you can see which one are the, the weird, is that a stone reality? What is that stone? Yeah. It's the, which one? The shakeout test. Is that a low test? I don't know. <laughs> okay. And, uh, more profits is coming. We're having some friends, some amigos, uh, coming. There's going to be more profits of Fonse. And I think with that, um, are we forgetting anything? Nothing, yeah, I think, nothing, no. So I think, yeah, drop a comment below, uh, like and subscribe this video if you enjoyed it, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and see you soon for another Perf Byte episode, I think. If you're listening in Apple Podcasts, in Spotify, uh, you know, the bell, activate thumbs up, stars, I think, is in some of others. Leave us a comment. We're always happy to receive them. And with that, um, Leandro out. And Henry Henrik out. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everybody, and um, keep performing or something. See you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>